for normal human movement to occur, you need a harmony of what's going on uh, with the feet as it interacts with the ground, and also what's going on up above in the cranium, really meaning the jaw and the teeth. So this is what you need for normal forward non-compensatory movement. You need feet that can go heel, arch, big toe on both sides. You need a pelvis that can alternate from side to side. You need a torso that can rotate from side to side. You need arms that can alternate. And you need a jaw that is free to move side to side. Otherwise, your body will be in a compromised state, which we call extension on one or both sides. So the name of the study, the association between masticatory muscle activation, these jaw muscles, and foot pressure distribution. And they're talking about a right foot, right foot pressure distribution, and luckily on this model, right jaw muscle activity. And they will correlate with uh, someone going over onto the right side, which is of course, in posture restoration, right dominance, left AIC, right BC, right TMCC pattern. And what is the conclusion of the study? An ipsilateral association, meaning same side association, was found between the right temporal muscle. There it is, the temporalis. The, that's a big freaking muscle. The right temporal muscle, it pulls the jaw up. It's a chewing muscle. And the right, fear and right rear foot load and right forefoot load, so basically the heel and the forefoot, as well as the percentage of muscle activation of the right masseter, and that's right here, so right here is the masseter, muscles with the percentage of pressure on the right forefoot and right rear foot. Whilst others, while further studies are needed, an ipsilateral same side association was found between masticatory muscles and foot pressure distribution. Meaning, the way you use your teeth, if I bring my teeth together on my right side, my body shifts right. If I bring my teeth together on the left side, my body shifts left. You're gonna see a video where that individual does not feel his left molars. He only feels his left canines. So if he were to bring his teeth together, he's feeling the wrong spot so his body doesn't shift. That's the importance of, of molars. If you do not have molar sense, posterior molar sense, you will not get heel strike. You're going to be forward. If you're feeling your front teeth more than your back teeth when you bring your teeth together, you feel your front teeth or your canine on either side, you're going to be a toe walker, basically for all intents and purposes. You have to heel strike like you have to molar strike first for a normal cycle of pelvic activity to occur. If you wanna know more about the science of posture restoration, there's a free download on my website. The link is in the description. Also, I'm located in Chatham, New Jersey. Uh, I do in-person training and I also do online consulting and all that information can also be found on my website. So as the study indicates, when you bite down on the right side, Jaw muscle activity occurs, your body shifts to the right. Now, as you shift to the right, your brain will sense the ground come up underneath your right foot as it leaves the left foot. So that association is made. Even if you're just chewing, if you're chewing, particularly on your right side, you're gonna be over on your right butt and your brain will make that association of, if I'm chewing, better be over on the right side when I do it. So that's the association between molars and heels, and you'll see in the videos that I'm going to show, I can, manipulate, I can manipulate the pressure sensors of teeth and feet, and I can turn on or turn off the left AIC pattern, meaning I can put them on the right side or I can bring them back to the center neurologically. It's really not a muscular issue. It's a brain, what the brain is sensing. So there are very important postural and movement related associations. Uh, between what's going on in your mouth and what goes on in your feet. Molars are heels. Uh, canines and uh, in, uh, incisors are going to be like toes. You have sensory input in the back of your body, molars and heels, and also in the front. Incisors, front teeth, and toes, and they tend to match up. So what happens if you lose these really, really important uh, associations, these sensory associations? Well, at the heart of it all is a pelvis that's going to come forward on one, the left, or both sides, a, 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 a rib cage that's going to extend, and quite often, when we really get tight, a head and neck that come forward. And now that can change the relationship of how the jaw and the head interact, and that can put people more on the front of their teeth rather than feeling their molars. Now, of course, look at how the jaw and the neck are so intertwined. If you end up with a straightened neck, meaning you lose the curve in your neck, 
as the head and neck come forward, the neck is going to flex at the base of the neck. It's going to come forward. The neck starts to straighten. And now you have all the, and I don't even have all the neck muscles there, but all those neck muscles can start to get tight in the front. It can strain your voice box. It can strain, it can create swallowing problems, speech problems, singing problems, uh, whatever it's going to be. And as that head and neck come forward, you have to look at how the, underneath here, you have this hyoid bone, which, and all these underneath uh, that go from the hyoid bone to the jaw itself. So as the jaw gets shifted, now you're going to have tension quite possibly through the temporalis muscle, the masseter muscle, that, uh, which will then further reinforce this forward head posture. And that's what really starts to, and it can start to kind of tighten your cranial bones. Because remember, the bones in that cranium in your skull have a little bit of movement to them. It allows a little bit of movement. Uh, when the muscles tighten at the jaw, they can restrict those cranial bones, particularly the temporal bones. And that's what creates uh, a lot of problems also because the temporal bones, as you'll see in this image, the temporal bones have an obvious relationship to the pelvic bones. It's there. They move the same exact way. So the temporal bones and iliums are the same. They do the same things. They go uh, in and out, in and out, forward and back. Uh, so the same thing happens at the pelvis in this left AIC pattern when the left side is forward and the right side's back. Just bring that up to the cranium and you'll find a left temporal bone that is externally rotated and a right temporal bone that is generally internally rotated, and which is why people will generally have more sense of their right molars. They'll be over on their right side and they'll often have less sense of their left molars and less sense of their left heel because they're just in, stuck in right, state, right stance phase of walking. So for normal forward movement, not only do you need molars, but you're also going to need the front teeth in the right spot, the canines. Now, when I go to my right heel or my right side, that would be right molar. Got it. Then I'd, be able to, I'd have to be able to hit my left canine. Why is that? Because once I go to my right side and my torso starts to rotate, the jaw will follow torso rotation. And then it leads you over to your left side where it reverses. Left heel strike, left molar, and then right canine. Got it. So my right, my jaw will shift, will start to swing to the right ever so slightly as I get to my left side and rotate my torso. Now I'm in left stance. So the jaw follows ever so slightly the torso rotation. Whenever you have an open bite, a cross bite like I did, uh, that, my mouth was my main issue and my vision, but we're just talking about the mouth. Uh, when you have a cross bite, an open bite, uh, that se those sensory inputs don't get lined up because your, remember, your, your teeth are not touching when you walk. Don't misunderstand me. Those associations have to be there. Like I just said, if I move my jaw left, my body will shift right, particularly when I'm standing. If I shift my jaw right, my body will shift left. Uh, that has, if that jaw is not able to move, the body underneath it can't move properly. And if the body underneath it can't move properly, that means the pelvis can't go cyclically in an alternating way as a normal walk. Your pelvis will not go to the left. It's going to stay oriented to the right. You're going to be stuck in this left AIC pattern. And your feet are not going to go through a cycle of heel, arch, big toe. Orthotics may or may not help. Sneakers, the best sneakers in the world, may or may not help if the issue if you have a uh, oral cavity issue, because the oral cavity issue is what your brain will key in on. So when people have open bites, cross bites, missing teeth, you'll often find that their bodies end up in systemic extension with their pelvis forward and the ribs up. So you have your body weight that's anterior, often hyperextended knees, anterior pelvic tilt on both sides, an increased lumbar, lumbar lordosis, they're overarched, uh, elevated chest wall because they're overarched, Rounded shoulders because they're overarched and they have to pull the shoulders forward as their neck and pecs tighten. Forward head, neck posture. Hypertonic, overactive neck, back extensors, hip flexors, and calves. It's just systemic extension. And often it's coming from uh, the lack of harmony between what's going on in the mouth and what's going on from the, in the, uh, from the ground through the feet because the feet can't go through normal cycles of heel, arch, big toe because of patterning. So whenever you have an oral cavity issue, the jaw, the teeth, uh, I just call it cranial disharmony. So whenever you have the cranial disharmony, as this image says, of the eyes, the jaw, the teeth, the tongue, and the diaphragms, it means you're not, you're, you're not diaphragmatically breathing. That will increase your sympathetic trunk muscles. Your, that will increase your fight or flight musculature, which means your back extensors, your hip flexors, and your 
anterior neck, and your, as a result, your posterior neck, like your upper traps will probably ache in your SCMs. Uh, and then that suppresses normal activity in the sacral area, which would be the hamstrings, the glutes, and the pelvic floor, which is what we need to use to stabilize the pelvis. But that drops off as the cranial disharmony remains for longer and longer periods of time because you become more sympathetic, more fight or flighty, and you get tighter and tighter and tighter. And that's a lot of people that come to see me. Uh, I was this person. Of course, I can still move. I still did things, but I was constantly tense, and I couldn't touch my toes. I couldn't squat. I had very limited ranges of motion. Uh, when I danced, I had no problems because the rhythm of the, movie, of, the, of the music kept my body flowing rhythmically. But when the music went away, because I was so restricted, my own internal rhythms couldn't get recognized by my brain. It's called uh, basal ganglia disease. It's called uh, you know, Parkinson's disease. They got to listen to an external cue. I didn't have Parkinson's disease, but nonetheless, I had a forward head posture, and I was certainly tight through my hip flexors and my back. So cranial disharmony throws off all the normal flow and rhythmic activity which walking is. Now, for the first video, remember, in the left AIC pattern, the left side of the pelvis is forward. And when the left side is forward, the left leg will not adduct. It will not go down to the table. So you're going to see uh, this gentleman. I adduct his leg, and it will not go down. So then I give him, or I tell him to put the tongue depressor between his left molars. So his brain is now sensing pressure between his left molars that he was not sensing before. And his hip flexors shut off immediately, which means his pelvis has moved into a more neutral position. This video is going to demonstrate how my friend's hip flexors on the left uh, respond to pressure coming from my hand at certain areas of her foot, whether it be the heel or the arch. I'm going to impress upon her brain pressure from my hands that would resemble pressure from the ground as if she were walking. So you're going to see that in the beginning, she is neutral. All right, her left leg is neutral. Now I'm going to put pressure on the inside. So this is a right foot, but the inside of her left heel, and it locks her up. Then I'm going to go to the outside of her left heel, which is where the left foot would hit in supination, and she has no problem. So then I'm going to go to the right foot, and I'm going to apply pressure to her right heel, and it locked her left side up. <laughs> and then I'm going to go to the, I think I go to the arch of her right foot. Did I go to the arch of her right foot? And I did. So I went to the arch of her right foot. Did you have any control over that? Now you'll see her right leg is going to add duck no matter what I do. So I, add, I adduct her right leg, so it doesn't matter. That's why no one is going to be the, that's why it's exceedingly, that's why I've never seen anybody be the opposite pattern, because it doesn't work the other way. When I am, when I am applying pressure to the outside of her left heel, the outside of her left heel, her hip flexors turn off, because that's heel strike. That's how a left foot would hit in a, this is a right foot, but if a left foot hits in a supinated state, it's going to hit on the outside of the heel. It's not even underneath the heel. Because remember, it is the, so this is the nerve that I'll be stimulating, the sural nerve. And you'll see the sural nerve, like I had shown previously, is really around the outside of the foot, on the, on the outside edges of the foot, not really underneath. So that's, that's the myth of minimalist footwear. I'm stimulating the edges of her foot, not underneath. So if you're wearing a very soft shoe or barefoot shoes, this human foot was designed for real earth, and that real undulating earth would hit the foot in all different directions, including around the edges, not just underneath. But if you're living on flat floors, you're only getting stimulation underneath, not along around the edges where that sural nerve is. So that's why <clears throat> when I say when people walk in in a pattern where their pelvis is forward on one or both sides, and they walk in with minimal shoes. Well, how would wearing minimal shoes change that? They're there because they're not getting the foot stimulation, as long as they're, they're you know, up here is not an issue. So it's around the edges of the foot and the arch of the foot that needs the stimulation, not just the plantar surface, not just the undersurface. That's why the whole minimal shoe thing is kind of from in a, in, a, in a PRI perspective setting for what I need done. Because I don't, I don't care what people wear. I only care what the testing says. 
Uh, so they're going to need a better shoe. So that's just an example of how applying pressure in the right spots will either turn her flexors off or turn them on, depending on what I want to do to her brain.